Hi, I'm Dr. Nathan Ritter from CardioGage.com. I'm a cardiologist in New York. This video is an introduction to vitamin K2. I've been hearing a lot about this from my patients. There have been comments on the website and on the channel, so I uh, decided to make some videos. Vitamin K2 is definitely not to be confused with vitamin K1. They're very different. They have unrelated functions and they are in different foods, so I think of them as two totally different things. There are multiple forms of vitamin K2, which makes things a little confusing. The forms are designated as MK and then a number. So MK4, MK5, MK6, the most famous MK7, all the way up to MK13. Here's a picture of MK7, which is the most popular form of supplemental vitamin K2. MK7 is the vitamin K2 that's in natto, which is a pretty yucky looking Japanese delicacy, which apparently tastes pretty strange and is kind of slimy. MK7 is well absorbed and it sticks around in the body for a long time, several days. So the levels of it don't go up and down on an hourly basis like other vitamins might. So what does it do? Vitamin K2 activates a protein called MGP, which keeps calcium out of the blood vessel walls. That sounds like a good thing. And it also binds to osteocalcin, a hormone, which leads to strengthened bone structure. So those are two really good things. It has many other reported effects, but these are the two most important probably. Where do we get vitamin K2 in the diet? It's in foods that you generally wouldn't think of as supposedly being healthy for you. Eggs, meat, cheese, dairy products of any type, liver, chicken, those types of foods in the Western diet have a lot of K2. In the Japanese diet, there's the natto snack that I mentioned before, which has an amazing amount of vitamin K2 in it, something like 10 times as much as any Western food at all. So the Japanese people get a lot of K2 from natto. That is, if you like it. How much vitamin K2 do we need? There is no recommended daily allowance from the government for vitamin K2 intake. It's not really known how much we need in terms of micrograms per day. But in terms of studied uh, supplemental doses, the most commonly used dose is 180 micrograms per day of vitamin K2 in the form of MK7. So bottom line is we don't know how much vitamin K2 we're supposed to get each day. I've been asked, so doc, how do I know if I need to take vitamin K2 as a supplement? The short answer is it's hard to know. For people who don't consume dairy, eggs, or meat, there's a substantial chance that you could have a low vitamin K2 level. But I don't know how to check somebody for low vitamin K2. There's a blood test called the undercarboxylated. There's a test called the undercarboxylated calcium. There's a test called the undercarboxylated osteocalcin test, which is a blood test. Um, I don't know how to get it. I was trying to figure out how to do it on myself to see if I need vitamin K2 myself, but I couldn't figure out how to get it done. So by the way, if anybody knows how to get that blood test done, please leave a comment below because I'd really like to know. So what is vitamin K supposed to do for us if we supplement with it? The thing it's really best proven to do is decrease chance of fracture in postmenopausal Japanese women. This is the study that shows that. It's also been studied in women on a Western diet and it's been shown to decrease chance of fracture and improve bone structure. So I consider it pretty well proven for this use. In terms of heart health, it's been shown to decrease calcium buildup in arteries a little bit, not as much as you would hope, um, and also it's been shown to increase the flexibility of arteries. For more about that, you can watch my video on vitamin K2 and heart health. As always, click like and subscribe for more content. It helps get the feedback. Any comments or questions, please leave them below.